Hello. I think I'm glad about being with you today. I'm not really sure with the text I'm going to have to interpret. It's called such major uh, divergence in interpretation, just like chapters 38 and 39. So I want to take the beginning part of this because uh, our lesson series has very little in it except for detailed structures about the new temple. There are some, some important things that we'll go through verse by verse, but I want to set the stage because there's been such controversy over this. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I think this fits in to the, to the literary context of chapter 33 through 39, which is a promise of restoration. And remember, 37 is the dry bones chapter about the nation being restored, and 38 and 39 is the promise of restoration after a northern invasion. Historically, we don't know when that fits. And now in 40 through 48, I want to give you a brief outline if I could. 40 through 43 is the restored temple. And then 44 and 46 is the ritual restored. And then uh, in 47 and 48 is the land reallocated uh, to the 12 tribes. So this obviously shows that the covenant is being reinstituted. And that was what's so important as far as the theological emphasis. God was renewing his covenant. God was resetting up the sacrificial system. And God was bringing them back into the land, which is a which is a basically renewal of all the covenant promises. And that was so significant to these people in exile. And remember, this section must relate to the people of Ezekiel's day who were in exile by the river Kibar. We can't just push it way out there in the future and have no historical context. It must fit into the history of the restoration and the return from the exile. Now, when I say that, I realize there are some problems. And I want to go through here. Uh, first, I want to deal with the attempts to interpret this, and then I, I want to go through some other things. Number one, attempts to interpret it. I was amazed. I have a large library, as you can see, and, and I go through all of these books every time I do a passage. I was amazed at how many of the books that I normally just cherish as far as their exegetical historical insight totally left this out. I want to tell you, commentators don't know what to do with it. They can't fit it in historically. It doesn't fit with a lot of their preconceived millennial ideals or eschatological plans, and so they ignore it. I much prefer uh, the millennialists, especially dispensational premillennialists, at least struggling with this. We must take the text seriously. And what we tend to do, uh, my brothers and sisters, listen to me, what we tend to do is put our overall pattern of understanding, we tend to take that before we take particular text. Now, our overall understanding and our systematic presentations are important, but they can't run headlong into specific texts. The texts are crucial, and we can't allow our systems or our a priori understandings twist, eliminate, or ignore a certain text. So I admit to you, chapter 38 and 39, we don't know where it fits. I don't think it fits in Daniel 11. Don't think it fits in Revelation 16. I don't think it fits in Revelation 20. And the same problem is true of this. Where does it fit? Now, I want to say to you something. I want you to hear it, and I hope you, I hope you understand with the emotion which I say this. It is as evil to overinterpret the Bible as to underinterpret it. It is as sinful, according to Revelation 22, to add our interpretation to the Scripture as well as to take away from the Scripture. So either ditch is an abomination. And I want to tell you, history is replete with groups, denominations, and renowned individuals on one ditch or the other in the area of biblical prophecy. Now, I want to say that must, this text must restore, relate to Ezekiel's day. The covenant restored, the cultus restored, the land restored, and foreigners excluded, which is 40 through 48, all fit into the social and theological milieu of Ezekiel. Now, how this, how this fits into the, uh, another day is a different question. Now, you say, well, why even apply it to another day? Why not just take all the prophecies about the return of the Jews and let them apply to the exile? Okay, I hear that. We want to take the text seriously. And it is obvious that many of these texts have never been fulfilled anywhere near the detail of Ezekiel of 40 through 48. And it's, it is a very detailed uh, passage. It is as detailed as Moses and the tabernacle. Now, think what I'm saying. 
But the, the pattern given to Moses on Mount Sinai for the tabernacle is the same kind of thing as what God gave to Ezekiel uh, as the angel messenger uh, showed him the temple and God spoke out of the Holy of Holies. Now, I think it's kind of like a renewal. It, it's like a beginning again. It's like a starting of a new covenant. Now, it's not the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 or Ezekiel 31 or, or 18, 33. It can't be because the new heart and the new mind's not here. Unless we take this as multiple fulfillment, which means they did repent, they did turn back to God to some extent, but nothing like they would when the Messiah came. So maybe it is partially fulfilled, the new covenant I'm speaking about, uh, in the return from the exile, but ultimately fulfilled in time of Jesus Christ, and especially his second coming. Now with that in mind, there are several options we could look at. Number one, it was never meant to be literally fulfilled. That's possible. It was always meant to be symbolic of the restored people of God. Now, though I, I, I'm drawn to that emotionally, and though I can certainly understand that when you put the overall pattern together, and there's a great book called Interpreting Prophecy by Milton, a Lutheran scholar that does just that. And yet the moment I say that, the moment I say that, the text is so definite. The text is so detailed. The text, especially 43, 10, and 11, looks like it's the pattern to be followed. And so I'm nervous about symbolizing it. Maybe we, it, we're into the area of conditional versus unconditional covenant, which means God wanted to build this temple, God would have built this temple, but the Jewish people did not respond in repentance and faith. And therefore, what God would have done, he couldn't do. Now, there's a real possibility there. Many of the Old Testament prophecies are not literally fulfilled because of the unbelief of the Jewish people. Now, before you get nervous with the third literal, literal, let me say this to you. We mean taking the text at its obvious meaning. If it's obvious poetry, we don't take it literally. If it's obviously a figure of speech, we don't take it literally. We take the text at its obvious meaning. Now, when I say that, I also realize that one of the major problems of the disciples was they took Jesus too literally. When he would say something, they would make it crassly literal and misunderstood completely what he said about Lazarus being asleep. They said, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up. Jesus said, no, he's dead. Now, we tend to do that because of our great love for the Bible. We tend to take it so literally because we don't want to abuse it or hurt it. But it's, it's language, and we must try to understand what the language is communicating, not just take it in a wooden, crassly wooden sense. Now, the second thing I want to say is, was this prophecy fulfilled partially in the return of Zerubbabel of the divinic line and the second temple that was rebuilt after Cyrus let them go in 538. If it is a partial fulfillment, it's not certainly not complete, because temple, the old men weeped when they remembered Solomon's temple, so it wasn't anything like this. And the temple that we have in Ezekiel 40 through 48 is much bigger and more beautiful than Solomon's in many ways. Do some say, well, maybe it was fulfilled in Herod's temple. Well, if it was, Herod didn't build along the plans of Ezekiel's temple. So obviously the prophet had the wrong floor plan. Now, the third one is that it's some future fulfillment. Now, I must admit to you that I feel, though I do not know where it fits in history, Zerubbabel, Herod, whatever, and because I'm looking for a more literal fulfillment, I'm putting it off in the future. Now, it's not going to hurt my feelings if it never happens, because I don't think that God's proved to be a failure if all his promises aren't to the T fulfilled, because we're forcing a Western view of the text on an Eastern text. And we can't do that. But I believe God can be trusted, and the Bible's the inspired Word of God. And so I tend to say futuristic. But when I say that, oh, I'm in great trouble now, because why is there a need for a full-blown temple, sacrifice, cultus, and priesthood when the book of Hebrews, chapters 9 and 10, says that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, and there's no more need? Even Pentecost admits that if this is future, it, the, the sacrifices must be memorial. And yet in chapter 43, the, the, the text says the sacrifices are for atonement. Now, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, and I don't understand how it fits in history, but I'm nervous about spiritualizing. Do you catch my dilemma? Now, um, let, me, let me deal with some of my personal problems as I go through here, and then I'll get to the text. Number one, I can't link 38 and 39 into any historical setting, and I can't I can't fit 40 through 48 into his, any historical setting, so I want to make it eschatological or future, though I don't know where or why or how it fits. Number two, 
The New Testament seems to exclude future sacrifices, Hebrews 9 and 10. This text speaks of Jewish exclusivism where foreigners are left out. And that seems to be totally abrogated with the coming of the New Testament, and especially the middle wall of partition being broken down in Ephesians 2 and 3. I feel very uncomfortable in Revelation being made a Jewish book because of someone's presupposition that the church in Israel must be separated and all prophecies must be literally fulfilled to the nation of Israel. I have two problems with that. Number one, we can't get the nations that surrounded Israel back to get the prophecies literally fulfilled. And the modern nation of Israel is much more European Khazars and a movement of Zionism than it is the natural seed of Abraham being brought back to the promised land. Number three, I think to some extent Jesus excluded the Jews as his instrument of redemption. Now what does that mean? Well, the parable of the wicked tenants is either a, 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 a devastating judgment on the leaders of the Jews or it's the removal of the Jews as God's instrument for the redemption of the world. When the Jews cried out, let his blood be on us and our kids, I'd go cold at that. Matthew 21, 20, 33 through 46, Mark 12, 1 through 12, Luke 20, 9 through 19. Now, my basic assumption is there is one basic covenant between God and man. It began in Genesis 3.15, it's going to end at the consummation of the second coming. I believe in a bodily, physical second coming. I believe in the literal fulfillment of all New Testament prophecies concerning the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation and all of that. But I must admit to you that I do think the church is spiritual Israel and that she has inherited all the promise of the Ancient One as she reaches out in mission to the world as they were went out to mission. You see, God only chose the Jews to choose the world. And God's chose the church to choose the world. It's not he has favorites and then people he doesn't like. Now, I want you to look at Romans 2, 28 and 29, all of Galatians 3, Galatians 6, 16, and Ephesians 2 and 3 to see if you buy what I'm saying about the church being spiritual Israel. Um, I wish I had a greater understanding of prophecy. Uh, I want to take the Bible seriously. I, I am an historical grammatical exegete. But there are times when the more I try to fit things together, the more I can't. I believe that all biblical prophecy is true, whether it's symbolic or partially fulfilled or literally. I think all of it is true. Now, it seems to me what we have is a problem of men's dogmatism and systems getting in the way of the truth of certain texts or passages. It seems that what we have is like a picture album of a family. There are certain pictures that have been taken out and certain pictures have been changed as far as order. When we go back in there, we must affirm the truth of all the pictures we have, but admit that we don't know the chronological or theological or sequential relationship between those passages. Now, that's what I feel about Ezekiel 38, 39, and 40 through 40. I want to take it seriously. I want to lay it to Ezekiel's day. I want to say that because it wasn't fulfilled in history, it's probably futuristic, but I don't know exactly how it fits. Now, with that in mind, let's go to chapter 43. Excuse me, 40. This seems, to, this seems to build on chapter 37, 27, and 20. All of 40 through 48 seem to build on chapter 37, 27, and 28. And I hope you'll read that because it shows you the new days coming and how important this was to a people who were so discouraged, who thought the covenant was totally broken and God had left them. These chapters had great significance to them. They seem uh, very much in line with Ezekiel's priestliness and his uh, exclusiveness as far as the Jewish nation that don't seem to fit at all in the end time setting. But now notice it says the 25th year of our exile, this will be about 573 BC. John's going to use much of this metaphor as he describes the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21. So this, this, this may be fulfilled in the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. Now exactly how it all fits, I just don't know. I know Hebrews talks about a tabernacle in heaven that Jesus entered one time. This may link to that. I'm just not sure. I wish I was. Now, at the beginning of the year, now there's two problems here. When's the beginning of the year? Some, pl some places seem to say there's a, a New Year's in the month of Tishri, which would be autumn, Leviticus 25, 9. Others say it's the month of Nisan. You know, we'll see Exodus 12, 2. Now, when the New Year begins, 
Some say it began one time before the exile and a different time after. I'm not sure when the new year began, so I don't know when the beginning of the year exactly is. Notice the mention of a high mountain here. Ezekiel is going to have another vision on a high mountain. Because of chapter 17, 22, and 2040, this seems to be Jerusalem. And because it says, and on it to the south, you see that in verse 2? Now the Septuagint has opposite it. If it, and it's the change of one Hebrew consonant to make it opposite instead of south. If it does mean opposite, it's the Mount of Olives. If it means south, we're not sure exactly what mountain, but probably overlooking the temple area. Now, notice the two measuring uh, units in, in verse 3. A line of flax and a measuring rod. Now, this line of flax is very important because that's how you d measure long distances. The measuring rod is really a measuring reed. It's the, the root idea of righteousness or straight edge. It was about ten and a half feet long, so the rabbis tell us. And so if it were a longer measurement than ten and a half feet or a circular measurement like a pillar, they would tie knots in a long string of flax to make a, a longer measurement. And that's about what we have here. Uh, notice it mentions uh, the outer wall in chapter 5. Now you might want to go to chapter 42, 20 where it seems to be 500 cubits square is the whole area. Notice it says a measuring rod of six cubits, each of which is a cubit and a handbreadth. Now, we, there are two different cubits. A cubit originally was from a man's elbow to the longest finger, 18 inches or so. But there's another one that added a hand breadth, which would be this. Now, this is a span from your t little finger to your thumb is a span. But a hand breadth would be your, the, the forefinger. A finger breadth would be one finger, okay? So a cubit and a hand breadth would be 18 plus about four, which is around 21, okay? That's known as the royal cubit. We find these two different cubits, both in Babylon and in Egypt, and we're not real sure which one. Here, it's obviously the, the 21, 22-inch one because it's mentioned so often. You might well see chapter 43, uh, 13, where the longer cubit is mentioned, okay? You might well see Deuteronomy 3.11 or 2 Chronicles 3.3 3 for the shorter cubit. Now, notice in verse 6, we have the steps went up. Verse 22, the steps went up. Verse 26, steps went up. Verse 31, the steps went up. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures here. Uh, there's a good one in, in this one, uh, Tyndale, a picture of the tabernacle, and you can turn and see how it looks. Uh, in the pulpit commentary is a picture of the tabernacle, and you can see uh, Ezekiel's uh, temple, excuse me, and you can see that. And probably an excellent one is in the Zondervan Pictorial Bible Encyclopedia. Now, if you'll notice as we go through these different descriptions, the inter, called the nave, the holy place, and the holy of holies, as we enter this eastern gate, the, the, the gates get smaller and the steps go up. Both of them show the, the, the rise of holiness as we enter closer and closer to the Holy of Holies, which in Ezekiel's temple seems to be empty, nothing in there. But th these steps going up and the narrowing of the gates seems to imply that. The narrowing of the gates can be seen in chapter 41, verse 2 and 3, okay? Let me go back to verse 40 for a minute where it says, notice in verse 40 where it says the singers in the inner court. Well, there's a real problem between the singers and the ministering priest. Maybe these locations, these little buildings were used for both of them. Notice in verse 45 where it says, this is the chamber which faces toward the south ex intended for the priest to keep charge of the temple. And notice in verse 46, the chambers that face to the north were the priests that kept the altar. Now, some of the priests offered the sacrifices, and some of the priests did the other menial chores of the temple, and so they were segregated into their uh, task assignments uh, here. Notice the sons of Zadok in verse 46, and that, of course, is what Ezekiel was. Now, Jeremiah was the, was the line of Abathar, which during the rebellion of Solomon and all was excluded from service, and Zadok is the one that ministered in Solomon's temple, and that's the line of Ezekiel. Uh, in verse 49, it says 11 cubits, but the Septuagint has 12 cubits, and that seems to fit. When you put the overall thing together, 12 cubits fits better. By the way, the Septuagint adds 10 steps to verse 49, and the Masoretic text just says it went up. Now, the two side pillars. This seems to be the two freestanding pillars of Solomon's temple, uh, Jake, uh, Jacobchen and Bo. Boaz, okay? And you might find them in 1 Kings 7, 15 through 22, 2 Chronicles 3, 17. They were freestanding pillars in front of the temple. Now going to chapter 41, notice in verse 4, this is the most holy place. We would call this the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt. If you'll look at those uh, pictures again of the floor plan, you'll see it's a perfect cube and it's the place where God symbolically dwelt 
above the cherubim. It was the footstool of his feet. And we'll get into that. Notice in verse 18, we have cherubim and palm trees. This is very much like Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 6, 8, 29, 1 Kings 7, 29, and 36. Now, these, uh, these cherubim are mentioned in chapter 1, though Ezekiel had another cherubim. In chapter 10, he recognizes them from the drawings on the Dr temple in Jerusalem. And the same ones are seen to be the, the beast of the book of the Revelation, chapter 4. Now, I have a, a picture that I think is as close as we can get to them in uh, Ancient Near East, uh, Volume 1, an anthology of text and pictures, and you can see maybe what a cherubim is like, okay? You've seen the, the winged bull of Asher Banipal, and then some of the drawings on some of the temple reliefs we found. Now, cherubim here only have two faces. Some say it's because it's hard to put four faces on a wall, but you could put three faces on a wall if you wanted to, one facing this way and that way. I think it's just difference of opinion on how many faces cherubs have. The one in the Ark of the Covenant seems to have one. The one in Ezekiel's picture seems to have four. The one in Revelation 4, there's four different creatures with different faces, and the ones here have two faces. Other places in Ezekiel, uh, they have uh, four faces. So it, there's a real contradiction here as far as how many faces cherubs have. Maybe the different ones have different numbers. I don't know. Notice the altar of wood in verse 22. Now, it's an altar of wood, but it's shaped, uh, but it's... Uh, it seems like it's the table of showbread. Now, notice the, the holy place, and that's not the holy of hope, but the place right in front of it uh, where the priest could come and minister. Uh, in Solomon's temple, there was the lampstand, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread. This is either the altar of incense or it's the table of showbread, and we're not really sure which it is. Uh, there are several references in your outline to the table of showbread. You might want to look them up. Now, in chapter 42... Uh, we're still measuring detailed measurements. It's a very detailed measure. It's kind of boring just to read through. And I, when I read through it, before I saw somebody's rendition of it, it's very difficult to put it together in my mind. It'd be very good to get a Bible dictionary or a commentary and try to find some kind of pattern to look at it, okay? Um, notice uh, the, t the priests are mentioned in chapter 42, verse 14. It talks about them leaving their garments and that. And then in verse 16, it says 500 reeds but it's got to be cubits. It's just a, a misprint in the Masoretic text. Remember that the, until 1947, the oldest copy of the Old Testament we had was the Middle Ages A.D. With the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, it pushed our Old Testament text round, back to around, uh, oh, several years B.C., but we're nowhere close to the, the text of Ezekiel, and so it's possible many copyists just foul some of these things up. Now notice the dividing wall in verse 20. It seems to be a dividing wall not for protection because it's not high enough, but it seems to be a dividing wall for holiness. Uh, and God's going to be upset about how his holiness has been impugned. Really this whole section is on God's holiness, how we uh, recognize that in the sacrifice, how we recognize that in the structure, how we recognize that in the way the priest minister. God is holy, sinless, and his people must approach him like that. Now, uh, chapter 43. Behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel was coming by way of the east. Now, God's glory, or the Shekinah cloud, the rabbis call it, had left because of the idolatry of the temple and the people. You might want to see Ezekiel describing that in chapter 10, verses 18 through 22, in chapter 11, verses 22 through 24. So God had symbolically left the temple that he had chosen to dwell in and had moved with the exiles. Now his glory returns and fills the temple, just like he did the tabernacle in the wilderness, just like he did Solomon's temple, and just as Isaiah saw him in Isaiah 6. Uh, notice the place of the, uh, the soles of his feet in verse 7. This is the idea that the Holy of Holies, where it was a footstool, God lived in heaven, but his feet rested on the Holy of Holies. Now we'll see Psalms 99, 5, 132, 7. Now notice this, the corpses of their kings when they die, the last of verse 7. Now some think this is saying that they, they should never bury these 14 kings so close to the temple wall because their presence profaned the temple. But it's possible to change the, uh, another translation here could possibly be monuments. And it's used in the Ugaritic literature that way. So it may be referring to idolatry, not to the tombs of the kings. Now, which is true, uh, I'm not really uh, certain. If you want to see a reference to the, the kings, uh, 1 Samuel 25, 1, 1 Kings 2, 34, 2 Kings 21, 18, 26. Um, 
Notice the conditional element that God says, now let them, and I will. Catch it in verse uh, 9, and again in verse 11, if they are ashamed, this covenant, this temple is conditional on their response and faith. We must remember that. Notice it says, I will dwell among them. There's the great promise of God. You might see chapter 37, verses 27 and 20. That's what God, I will dwell with you. It's the root of the term Emmanuel. It's the goal of Genesis 1 fulfilled in Revelation 22 and symbolized here in Ezekiel 40 through 40. God with his people who are faithful to him. That's why I don't think modern Israel is a fulfillment. Modern Israel is not a religious state. It certainly is not a messianic religious state. It's a secular state. It has, it has trappings from the Old Testament, but I think that's as far as it goes. Uh, notice the, the altar is described in verses 13 following. This altar had four horns. That was the most holy part where the blood was smeared. You now we'll see uh, Exodus 29, 17, Ezekiel 43, 20. And you can see many pictures of this. It was like a, a stair-stepped one. We found many examples of this archaeologically, this stair-stepped temple. Uh, it was for atonement, not for memorial. See chapter 45, 15, 17, and 20. Um, these horns are mentioned in your outline several different places in the Bible. Uh, the ceremony involves salt in verse 24. You ought to see uh, Leviticus 2.13, Numbers 18.19. Notice the last part. I will accept you. And that's the whole purpose. God and man being brought together. Uh, Ezekiel, with his background in the priestly rites of the temple, saw this acceptance in a sacrificial system. Now, whether that's ultimate or culturally conditioned, I don't know. Because of Hebrews 9 and 10, I feel like it's culturally conditioned, and Jesus has fulfilled that, and now the doors are wide open for us to come to God. All of our interpretation of biblical prophecy must relate to God's overall plan of the redemption of mankind through Jesus Christ. I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again same time, same place next week.